Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Knowing the Father, Getting to Know God as Father. It's a very important topic because God wants us to get to know Him personally and intimately. That's why He sent His Son Jesus into the world to reveal the Father to us. We've been looking at the basis of this in the Old Testament and we see that God the Father revealed Himself in so many ways in the Old Testament through so many names and through so many revelations. We've also seen that there was a series of revelations in the Old Testament which were extremely unusual. These were the appearances of the angel of the Lord. We find various Old Testament characters like Jacob and his father Abraham who met with angels and in particular one who is called the angel of the Lord. And here we have the understanding that God is not just one, he is one, there is only one God, but that he is also more than one. He's revealed himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the angel of the Lord, who appears in the Old Testament, carries the authority and the presence of God himself. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, he said, I have seen God. We're going to talk more about the angel of the Lord. So the angel of the Lord is identifiable as God, yet distinguishable from God. He underlines the mysterious, uh, underlines God's mysterious one, but more than one nature. How are we doing so far? Are you following me so far? That's only the Old Testament, okay? So we see in the Old Testament that the, we have the foundations of what we call the doctrine of the Trinity or the triunity of God. God is the triune one. He is one God, but more than one. Not more than one God, but there is a more than oneness about him. So the New Testament develops this understanding that God is one yet more than one without ever using the term Trinity. Now, uh, some people take this uh, as highly significant and say, therefore, the Bible does not teach Trinity because the word Trinity is not found. Well, you find many words that we use that are not in the Bible. For example, omnipotence. You don't find that word in the Bible, but you find the truth of God's omnipotence in the Bible, don't you? You find the truth that God is all-powerful. So all the word Trinity is, is a, is a word used by teachers of the Bible, to describe the Bible's teaching about God. And so the New Testament provides information about Jesus and the Spirit, which shows that, he, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. For example, the New Testament shows that Jesus has a divine nature. He is God. And the Spirit also is God and has a divine nature. And so, God the Father is fully God, God the Son is fully God, and God the Spirit is fully God. Now, the New Testament doesn't now try and, try and draw some conclusions from this and, and present it to us in a systematic way. So you say, well, if the New Testament doesn't, why shouldn't we? Well, we, we should and we must, because our job is aided by the Holy Spirit. As our minds are in submissive to the, submission to the revelation of God, our job is to receive God's revelation and appropriate it and grasp it. God has given us this to do so that we can know him and understand him according to his revelation. Now, there are four groups of passages in the New Testament which imply to us God's nature is essentially triune, three in one. 
The first set of passages are those which use what we call a Trinitarian formula. Perhaps the most familiar of these is Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name or into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One name, not the names of, but the name of. One name, which is talking about God, and we know what that means. We've been looking at that, the name of God. That's his nature. One name, but this name is Father, Son, and Spirit. So we have one name, but three distinctions, three descriptions here, which we come to understand to be three persons. And so Father, Son, and Spirit are used in the Trinitarian baptismal formula. That's why when we baptize people, we should baptize them using the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of course, it's all done in the name of Jesus because that's our authority for doing it. But we baptize them into the one name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We've come to know this as the Christian grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, I want you to see there that when it speaks about God the Father, Paul shortens it to simply God. And we've got to grasp this. I'll pick up on this point later. That often in the New Testament, when the word God is used, specifically, we are intended to understand by that God the Father. And here's one of those cases. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that? God the Son. And the love of God, who is that? God the Father. And the communion of the Holy Spirit, who is that? God the Holy Spirit. And so, there's no distinction made. They're just presented to us as co-equal. There's no distinction, no order, no priority. Jesus is mentioned first here. Most often, the order is Father, Son, and Spirit. Here, Jesus is mentioned first, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 8, the uh, Spirit is mentioned second. John to the seven churches of Asia, grace and peace come from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven, seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and has washed us from our sins in his own blood, and I'll go on reading because it's blessing me, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they will, even who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. That's the second amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, I'll stop there. All right, but did you notice in the earlier verses there that it's referring to God and then to the Spirit, or the seven spirits, which is the sevenfold spirit, and even the use of the number seven there is significant because it's a number of completion or perfection showing the divinity of the Spirit of God. So it is Father, Spirit, and Son. So we have here, it seems to me interchangeable. We have Father, Son, and Spirit. That's the characteristic description of the Trinity. Then we have Son, Father, and Spirit in Corinthians. And now in Revelation, we have Father, Spirit, and Son. So all of these things show the Trinitarian formula that God is one God, but there are three aspects to him, three persons to this one God. And so, all Father, Son, and Spirit are seen to be sovereign, the sovereign, majestic, almighty God. Now, moving on. The second class of scriptures are those which use a threefold structure not the actual specific Trinitarian formula, but there is a triadic structure, a threefold form. For example, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, six speaks of one Spirit, one Lord, one God. One Spirit, God the Spirit. One Lord, Jesus Christ. One God, God the Father. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 3 to 6 introduces the same Spirit, God the Spirit, the same Lord, 
the Lord Jesus. The same God, God the Father. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 uses the same triadic structure to stress different functions of the Father, the Spirit, and, G and Jesus, with it seems to be some sort, of, some sort of sequential link. 1 Peter 1 verse 2, you are elect, which means chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, grace to you and peace be multiplied. There seems to be some kind of salvation order taking place. First of all, God the Father has chosen us in his election. Then the Holy Spirit has set us apart in sanctification for God for the purpose of obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the seal of God upon our lives. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, point to the same threefold sequential structure and to different divine functions. In verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself according to the pleasure of his will. Verse 13, to the pray, verse 13, in him also you trusted after after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so we see Father, Son, and Spirit here referred to in this kind of triadic structure. And the way in which the writers of the New Testament move in between Father, Son, and Spirit, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Spirit, God, how the way the writers move between these three persons suggests very, very strongly that they are referring to one God who exists eternally in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Then there are those passages which mention the three persons together. Uh, this is not so much a triadic structure, but we see the three persons of the Godhead together. For example, in Mark 1, verses 9 to 11, where we have the baptism of of Jesus. We have the Father speaking, Jesus of course present, and the Spirit upon him. And then in 2 Thess Thessalonians 2 verses 13 to 14, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you brethren beloved by the Lord because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verses 20 to 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we see here the Trinitarian references because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are mentioned within the same context in the same passage. Then there are those passages, very interesting ones, which reveal Trinitarian relationships. I want to spend some time on this. The link between the Father and the Son and the Spirit is clearest, I think, in the New Testament in Jesus' teaching in the Last Supper. Have a look, for example, in John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, notice that, I'm going to send him to you, but he is from the Father. Who is he? The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. John 16, verses 13 to 15. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears... He will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and glorify uh, uh, and gl declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. So these kind of verses reveal both the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit and the distinctiveness of their three divine persons. So we see that the Father sends the Spirit in the name of the Son. And we also see that the Son sends the Spirit 
who issues from the Father. So the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, are involved in the revelation of truth to men and women. The Father sent the Son to reveal the truth, and the Spirit has sent into the world so that he will take of the things of Jesus which the Father has committed to him and reveal them to us. And so we have this Trinitarian relationship. And we see it in other passages very, very clearly. John chapter 1 and verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, who is this? Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This does not mean that the Son of God was born, other than perhaps in some eternal sense, the eternal generation of the Son of God by the Father. No, he wasn't born at a point in time. He wasn't created. The creed says, begotten, not created. Begotten, the, eter the only begotten of the Father. Begotten, not created. So it doesn't mean to say he is the firstborn of creation. He is the firstborn over creation. And this is uh, the demonstration of his sonship. The firstborn was the heir. And because Jesus is the unique Son of God, he is the heir of all creation. So this is not talking about him being born at a point in time. This is talking about the whole creation being made for him. And then it goes on to show that he is not himself made because he created all things. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. This puts Jesus Christ in a category totally distinct from all created beings because he himself is not created. He is the uncreated, eternal Son of the eternal God. And so we see that these actions which are ascribed to Jesus, such as creation, are normally attributed to God, showing that Jesus Christ is not just a created being. He himself is the agent of creation and therefore must be God himself. And it's even more than that, because if you notice, it says there in Colossians 1, verse 17, that all things were created by him and for him. This shows us the purpose of creation. And this is what I'm beginning to unpack now when I've been saying in earlier sessions that we need to understand the essential nature of, uh, of the revelation of God as Father. Because, you see, it explains why we're here. It explains why God created God the Father created all things for God the Son. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the Son of God and therefore heir of all things. And the Father said to the Son, Son, I'm going to create the universe and it's going to be yours, my Son. This is your inheritance. You're going to inherit all of this. All things were created by him and for him. All right. Okay. Okay. I know we're in very, very uh, heavy material, and this is profound material, but let's continue to rely on the Holy Spirit to refresh us and to anoint our understanding. All right. Now, I'm going to emphasize what I need to do very quickly to balance this. We're not just talking about a tri. We're talking about a unity. Not just about a three, but a one. That's what tri-unity means. Trinity. Three in one. So as well as pointing to three distinct persons, the New Testament also re-emphasizes the absolute unity or oneness of God. Jesus' words in John 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one. And this was such a clear statement that the Jews wanted to fetch stones to kill him for blasphemy because they were, he was making himself equal with God and calling God his Father. John 1, verse 1, look at this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here we have a, a, an identification with the second person of the Trinity as being God. 
In the beginning was the Word, which means that before the world was created, the Word already existed. That's what the Good News Bible translates this as. Before the world was created, the Word already existed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Um, what, what that means is proston theon in the Greek. The Word was towards God. So here we have the picture of the Father and the Son towards each other. It's a relationship picture, and that also presupposes the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of fellowship and communion. So we have here, from all eternity, the Father and the Son existing together in perfect, total unity and communion. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Here we have a second alongside God. The Word was with God. And then it goes to say, and the Word was God. And the word order here, and the way that the, the Greek is constructed, constructed shows the emphasis on the divinity of the Word. It's an emphatic order. The Word was God. You could almost say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. You can almost say that. It's an over-translation, but that's the emphasis that comes out in the Greek. The Word was God, and God was the Word. God was the Word, showing the full divinity of Jesus. And so we have the understanding that although Jesus is a, a second alongside God, he fully shares the nature of God, the exact same essential nature of God, because God is one. And here is something which the Bible asserts, but as in so many other places and so many other topics, never, never explains. Jesus says in John 10, 38, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. This is the essential oneness. So we can say that the New Testament develops the Old Testament understanding of God as one but more than one by clarifying that the more one element, clarifying the more than one element without weakening the stress that he is only one. Let me read that again so that we, we catch it. The Old Testament teaching that God is one but more than one is clarified in the New Testament by the understanding that God is more than one without weakening the stress that he is only one. It reveals that the more than one really means three. And therefore, some believers assume that these three distinctive beings within God that these are three distinctive beings within God who in some mysterious way are united, rather like a committee, you know? Well, not that the committees are often very united, but anyway, it was a good try. No, it's not like that. We're not talking about three distinctive separate beings because that would make kind of three quasi-gods. No, there is one God who exists eternally as one being, but there are three distinctions. One being who exists eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, because today the word person seems to uh, suggest individual and separate existence, I prefer to describe this as three unipersons. Three unipersons, because that emphasizes a little bit more of the, the original meaning of the Latin persona rather than the English word person, which associates the idea of an individual person. So it's better to say that there is one God who exists eternally in three unipersons, not three modes of being, as some people teach. Old Testament, God the Father. Gospels, God the Son. The rest of the New Testament, God the Holy Spirit. One God who has revealed himself in three different modes. No. One God who exists eternally in three unipersons. One God, God the Father, God the Son, 
God the Holy Spirit. And so it's vital to grasp this point. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are three self-distinctions within one being, not three distinct individuals. God is one. He's not divided into three. But he reveals his nature and his oneness in a threefold diversity of unipersons, of characteristics, and of functions. Now, uh, in one of the later sessions, I'll talk more about the Holy Spirit, but in this session, I've been concerned to lay a foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity, and I've concentrated on the relationship between the Father and the Son. So the Father existed from all eternity as the eternal Father, and the Son existed from all eternity as the eternal Son of the eternal Father. You cannot have an eternal Son without an eternal Father. You cannot have an eternal Father without an eternal Son. So God existed eternally as Father, Son, and Spirit as well. Father, Son, and Spirit. And that is such a summit of revelation concerning the New Testament. And it's the very heart of what God has come to reveal about himself. And so, even when we focus on God the Father, remember that can only come by the revelation of God the Son. We would not know the Father unless we knew the Son. And we would not know the Son unless the Father reveals him to us. And in the sessions that come from now onwards, we're going to look more deeply into God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, so that you can understand the significance of the work of Jesus Christ and the revelation of God. And here it is in summary as we conclude that the Son has revealed the Father to you and to me that together we can know him as Father and worship him in spirit and truth. God bless you. Keep thinking. Keep pondering and meditating these glorious truths. And we in the future sessions will go even deeper still. God bless you until then. And that brings today's teaching on knowing the Father to an end. I pray that as you've been watching today and throughout all these programs, God will be drawing you closer and closer to his love, that you will really get to know the Father. We'll be back next time with more in the Sword of the Spirit series on knowing the Father. God bless you.